we're going to be doing the panel on theory, data, and more theory. And um, the first um, talk for the panel is going to be um, done by Mercedes Pasquale. Um, she is now at the University of Chicago, but she has been a colleague of John's for many years here at University of Michigan and continues to be a colleague um, at University of Chicago. Um, so, um, I don't need that. So anyhow, as I said yesterday, I, I was very lucky to have John as a mentor, uh, not just as a, as a colleague and a very generous mentor. Now, we, uh, yeah, in my, in my real life, the one with a compass, at least in my science, I, I work on infectious diseases, on climate, on things like this, but uh, John and I are having this uh, discussion on whether that's theory because it's too much data fitting. So today I'm going to talk about something more irrelevant. But, but something that, uh, that we enjoyed uh, discussing when we, and I have very little time, when we went down, uh, when we met in the hall, and, and, and something that he enjoyed in our work. So, uh, and I should say, we heard yesterday many examples. I think Shaki gave uh, wonderful pictures of the attractors. I said he admired that John could sort of start a talk with this beautiful theory and then suddenly switch to what he really wanted to do, something about the, the, whatever, the politics, the compass, whatever we were talking about. And, uh, but what I admire is, is actually that he can do that, that he can tell you about the beautiful theory, and he cannot switch to that. He can actually switch uh, to something in ecology, and he has this conviction that, in fact, you can, with some simple and abstract theory, uh, explain phenomena in the real world. And this is particularly admirable in a theoretician who actually spends time in the real world, which is not generally the rule. So, so he really believed this. And I wasn't really uh, lucky enough to spend time with him in the, in the field. The closest I came to it was this uh, working group in the Netherlands uh, with Professor van der Meer uh, and, and Yvette. This was, a very, uh, this was on critical transitions, a very stressful workshop. The usual subjects, you can see Martin Schaefer uh, there, I mean, um, very much all about tipping points. There was field work, John there doing uh, uh, this. And there was a lot of, uh, of course, a lot of uh, meditation and deep thinking. <laughs> but, so, but anyhow, so this, all of this was about uh, critical transitions in the sense of tipping points. We have heard all about these uh, alternative steady states, temporal systems. But John and I would enjoy talking about these things in spatial temporal systems. That's something he likes a lot. And in fact, uh, he has applied these ideas. This is one of these examples where he has found um, a way to connect those. Uh, this is a well-known paper of his in Nature, where he has described these clusters of uh, ant colonies, these power laws that uh, then he has used to compare his model to, to the data, the scaling patterns that characterize this, this system with a critical transition. And he said, tells us this is an example of how spatial dynamics at large scale can affect ecosystem service at the local level. Uh, and so this, again, uh, an example of connecting the theory to the data. At that same time, here is his paper. There, was, uh, there were other papers uh, pointing out these kinds of uh, scaling laws uh, power law-like patterns in ecosystems, in this case in uh, vegetation systems along gradients. So despite of parameters, you can think that uh, these systems along very, very broad gradients have these patterns. This is, uh, he used in his title something that came from uh, our work with Manoj Droy, who is also here, and that made us very nervous because after all, this was the, the title of a paper in Nature, and we used that uh, in our discussions very very much um, uh, in a way we, we never felt very comfortable with this, with this, but he put it right in the title, which was like, <laughs> okay, and, and we thought, oh no, the physicists are going to be a bit mad. But, but then, um, anyhow, the idea here was that this, these kinds of phase transitions typically would, uh, would create a power law at one, at one critical point from which then if you moved, if you change the parameters, they would kind of evaporate and, uh, and so uh, we had pointed out in a very, very abstract, uh, non-relevant paper that, uh, <laughs> that these power laws in this simple stochastic predator-prey system on a lattice, these local interactions, 
uh, could generate at a percolation-like point where you get this, the appearance of this power law that then could, uh, in the size of the clusters of the prey, could exist uh, in a broader region of parameter space. And there was a bit of theory associated with this. We had this illusion that uh, maybe if we could took, took complex models, we understood these scale-free patterns. It would, it would tell us why uh, we, can, we can apply simple temporal models that do not have space, despite the patterns, the kinds of models we use, so that there was a deep connection between these uh, types of patterns and these simple models that to some degree capture space in an implicit way. This is a program we never finished. So I'd like to tell you today about um, something that does connect to the, the real world, perhaps more in a more relevant way, but it's still an example of very toy models that apply to the real world. And along these lines of critical phenomena, but now for processes that spread, that grow very fast relative to the regrowth. So this uh, uh, disturbance, which is the predation, is very fast relative to the to the, the, the recovery of the system. So this uh, is about uh, forest fires or epidemics, which have a lot of common, and uh, the particular case of epidemic cholera. So very quickly, you can say who cares about power laws, and you can find many papers that say, that say uh, they do not matter that much, because in the end, um, we can create them in many ways. It's not true if you actually think about birth death processes, that make sense as mechanisms in ecology or in anything, as mechanisms of birth and death, there are in fact two classes of ways you can create them. With the phase transitions, something at which at a critical point, uh, the system, for example, suddenly has a very large cluster, something changes very drastically. But this typically is not very good because as you move from this point, uh, the, the pattern as we discussed disappears. And then there was this wonderful idea of self-organized criticality, this sun pile um, model, para paradigmatic model in which you get avalanches of all sizes, a model that was, uh, tr uh, well, people tried to apply to the extinction of species, to all sorts of things. But that has the problem that because the system self-organizes, all parameters lead to similar path, the same pattern, and that's not very realistic either. So let me show you how a very simple modification creates another way we can get this, um, these patterns in a very broad way. And the significance then is that you cannot have the small events without the surprising, unpredictable large events that are unavoidable. So this is an example in which, from the real world, in which you can say as people vaccinate, vaccinate less and less their children, this is in the UK, the epidemics of measles return, but this is a phenomena that has lots of extinctions. You get these epidemics that appear and disappear. This is in cholera and historical times, away from the endemic Bengal, where you get these huge epidemics that then disappear and appear again, and they all scale like power laws. I don't have time to uh, go over this. This is a toy model. I wanted to say that uh, it's a modification of the uh, typical forest fire mall, but it's just a toy mall. And in particular, you have this local rate of spread versus recovery that is an important parameter. But what I want to show you is that you can have, in this same model, you can go all the way from one uh, critical transition to self-organized criticality as you get the spread faster and faster. So as that parameter goes from one, the power law is born, then you go and uh, have another power law like at self so, so these are two critical behaviors that appear in the same model and are linked as we increase these parameters. So the pattern doesn't go away because you are going from one to the other. And therefore, for all this regime, you can find uh, similar patterns and these unavoidable large events. You can also ask, does the, do the cholera uh, epidemics or the fires, do they turn around or do they die because they don't spread well or do they die because they spread too well and they no longer have susceptibles 
or the fuel to propagate. You can ask that by fitting this simple model. And I want to end by saying, well, even this simple model can tell you something about the real world. This was a paper on fires in uh, forests of Canada by uh, postdoc Richard Zinn. And this is one example where you see this behavior. And you could see that uh, around 1980, uh, there was this drastic change. This parameter is still below one, but it's very close to one. So these fires are very close to critical. And at this time, 1980, there was a change that brought, it, it brought the fires even closer to critical. This corresponds to a time when the temperatures globally also jumped. Now, in cholera, we also made this connection. The blue is the data. We fitted the mold. The, I don't know if the blue is the data or the mold of the or the mold. Doesn't matter. This is, in, <laughs> but it was fitted, John. I'm sorry. Uh, this was in in, in historical uh, in uh, British India, but this is current Africa. The the whole point here is that for cholera, that parameter is quite larger than one. So it means these epidemics are not turning around because they are not <coughs> propagating effectively. They are turning around because they are running out of people to infect. So the disease spreads like very aggressive wildfires. And we wrote as the last sentence of the paper, maybe something obvious, but that treat treatment and uh, vaccination during an epidemic, uh, despite their clear value to individuals, are unlikely to achieve the results of basic sanitation and access to clean water so that you cannot act once the epidemics have started. You have to act in between and that you need much uh, bigger structural and sustained changes to stop this kind of disease from propagating. So examples of this uh, very kind of silly model applied to, to the real world and, and something that we have uh, <coughs> discuss a lot with John, who likes a lot spatial patterns and critical phenomena. There is the hope, if you apply this to political systems, <laughs> that uh, since the power laws are unavoidable and they exist broadly, that the large events uh, will come. <laughs> <laughs> so. An easy question, please. Oh, <laughs> uh, thank you for for this very interesting theoretical talk. <laughs> but so I was. Um, um, when, when you were talking about, about, about fires and, uh, and, and, uh, and critical transitions in fires, you, well, it was very, very nice to see how there was a, a, a sharp transition at some point. But then you said something that, 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 that made me think, well, th that's not the traditional uh, or the, 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 the standard way in which um, uh, you know, small changes in some environmental variable in some external forces like when they change very slowly in the end at some point over cer uh, certain threshold there is a jump in the response so a, 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 a critical shift a regime shift in in the system so you were saying oh but that that happened just at the time well, that, that the global was just temperature to, that was speculation because we know in yeah. 1976 it was a time when we uh, we, you see globally the temperatures had, had a change and in fact were followed by many years of, of, uh, of uh, stronger energies and so on and we maybe we enter in a phase like this. So that was a little bit of speculation yeah. about the correspondence but that doesn't matter. The, the, the point was that the, the system was getting closer to, uh, to essentially supercritical. So below that, below one, the, those fires are not they are, they are not, essentially the size of the fires is determined by the inefficiency to propagate. If they cross one, then you have the opposite. You have something that is propagating 
very effectively and now has this very long tail, which you didn't have before. So now these very large fires would become part of the picture, unpredictable but part of the picture. So that's the significance of uh, crossing one there. But above one, you'll retain this long tail in the distributions, even if it's a phase transition, just because you are moving towards a different form of criticality. So it's kind of interesting that you have both in the system. And I think that's probably common, because this is just a birth death process in, in, you know, in a system that has a much slower regrowth and much slower spark of new New, new infections coming from outside the system or sparking the fire. So just that separation of time scales, but otherwise it's very generic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 now I remember that I'm, uh, we're reading something and, and I, I should cite some of this paper. In this <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. <in this> <laughs>